All right, Ken. It's the first time we're speaking in a while, I think. Right? It's been it's been a minute. It's been a yeah. minute. Yeah. So uh, I just want to start by saying, um, well, I met you at One Taste way back when, uh, when you were the head instructor over there. And yep. before I met you, I heard about you because you had this um, reputation as being the master stroker, and I heard this and that. And I was in a stroker's clinic with you, which we, we, we can maybe explain, but it was the first time I had heard people speak about energy in like a normal, mm -hmm. not hippie way. And it totally like, I remember getting a headache and like, what's going on? Like, is this like some weird reality I'm in now? And then maybe a few weeks later, um, we were in like the residence and I was eating a glass, I was eating cookies and milk. And this is our, I, think, I believe this is our first interaction. You walked in, you took one of the cookies, you put it in the milk with like such attention, like like a, a stroker's attention, like moving it so that every part of the cookie like had milk except for like where your fingertips were touching. <laughs> and then pulled it out and ate it and like that was our first interaction. And ever since then I was like, whoa, okay, well he's definitely got something that most people don't have. And then I got to know you better later, but um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's been fun knowing you thus far and I'm looking forward to this. Well, that's, that's quite a memory. I, I, I don't specifically remember that moment, but that so sounds like it's exactly something I would do. I, I totally, I totally believe it. Yeah. Um, so, and there's a lot of things we could speak about, but what have you been up to since I last seen you? I think it's been a couple of years. Yeah. So, um, you know, if you're, if your audience is familiar with one taste, I left one taste about 2000 in the, in January of 2014. And I kind of gifted them all of my IP. I said, here, everything I created while I'm there, you guys take it and run with it. Like, it's yours. And I just started from scratch. And I just said, I'm going to start from first principles. What, are, what do I actually believe that I know about sex? What do I actually believe that I know about relationships? Like, just like the basics. What do I believe that I know about, about living? And started just like, creating new classes from scratch stuff that I'd never taught before and just take doing test runs. Like, here's what I think I know about jealousy. Let's do, let's do a lecture and see how it lands. Or here's a, you know, here's what I think I know about any subject. And then I would go and I taught a bunch of workshops in 2015. And then that kind of got, I kind of got burnt out on workshops, but I've just been coming up with my new thing and what I've been doing the other thing I've been doing is just working with couples. I love working with couples. I'm super interested in how sex can be great when you're in a committed relationship. I'm super interested in how relationship dynamics change when a woman steps into her power. So I'm kind of creating my new, my new curriculum, my new, my new thing that I'm bringing to the world. And, you know, I, I, I'm working on a book about it, but that's, that's, that's what I've been doing since, since we talked. Awesome. Uh, I know you have a book, Powerful Women, Confident Men. Is that the title? Yeah. Did it come out already yeah. or is that the one that's coming out soon? You know, I spoke to a bunch of people and uh, I, I decided that I, what I wanted to do was go with a traditional publisher and there's a long lead time doing that. So, and then in order to do that, you really need to focus on your platform first. So the book is on hold. It's, it's going to happen, but I'm focusing on just like, these days I'm just focusing on visibility, like getting into magazines, getting, you know, getting, getting visibility, the visibility that I strove so hard to avoid when I was at one taste or like uh, up until recently, like I didn't want the spotlight and now I'm comfortable. Now I want the spotlight. Now I actually want to be, you know, uh, I want, I, I want to, bring what I, I not only want to bring what I'm bringing to the world, I want to be known for it in a way that I didn't want that before. So what like caused that, that shift? Um, I, it started with a feeling that I didn't, I had spent 15 years taking what I knew and offering it to people through the lens of some other organization. First, it was my mentors, then it was One Taste, and then it was like a couple of different things. And I just said, like, no more collaborating, no more like doing it under the auspices of something, someone else, no more golden handcuffs, really. I like, I have a thing that I want to bring to the world. And I'm going to have to take on all the things that I've been avoiding. I like when, you know, 
I'm going to have to learn how to market myself. I don't know how to market myself. I, I'm a teacher, right? Like I'm not a marketer. I'm a teacher. So um, it's just, it, it's, it was necessary for what I want to do in the world to confront that I have, that I, I was, I enjoyed being behind the scenes and now I need to be upfront and bring it to the world. Gotcha. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause you, when I met you, you had kind of, I mean, it was, it was added to the mystery and the intrigue that like Ken Blackman comes out to teach and it has these spots, but no one really knows, at least in that community. Like I didn't really know who you were until um, so, okay. Yeah. The, the shift is interesting. Um, yeah. I do want to speak oh, wait, about the wait, there's something interesting there that I want to say. So this is an, this is, uh, 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 an admission that's related to that. So there was the mystique and there was like me not wanting to be seen, but there was also me not feeling comfortable with connection, you mm -hmm. know, like just not feeling good about myself and not feeling good about connection. So as I, I've learned a ton in the last few years, like I've grown as much as my 15 years in the last five years. So my relationship to just who I am as a person has changed as well. I, cool. so I, yeah, I can relate to that a lot. I mean, uh, I've said this maybe too many times, but up until like a year and a half ago, I didn't realize anyone listened to this podcast. So I felt very, really, really chill about it. Like speaking about anything, not really thinking, like assuming no one was going to listen to it. I was just talking to the guest, and then, in the last year, I realized, oh, wow, I actually have people listening. Like, I better take it a little more seriously. I was like, oh, shit, this is like, there's all this tension and responsibility and fear associated with actually being seen. I still don't know how many people listen to it, but I know somebody does. Yeah. And just it's a whole shift in, in behavior and feeling around it. Well, it's interesting you should say that because my experience was similar, but also in a way kind of opposite. Because when I first started, like, just, I'm going to take on my business. I'm going to take on my, like, I'm going to create my own thing. I tried really hard to learn how to market myself. And I was bad at it. I wasn't good at it. I was good at figuring out what people wanted. I wasn't good at writing articles that people wanted to read. I wasn't good at creating workshops people wanted to take. I wasn't good at it. And it was reading as fuck. And one day I just said, fuck it, I'm just going to teach the course I would want to teach. I'm going to write the article I would want to read. And every time I was willing to do that, uh, it was great. It got great response and, and knocked it out of the park. So one of the lessons to me was, I think there are some people who are great at marketing, like figure out what people want, know how to do all that stuff, know how to write an article that people want to read, how to create it. I don't. Oh, the only thing that has ever worked for me is doing the passion, doing what I personally am passionate about and then seeing if people are interested in it. So if I were to do a podcast, the only way the, the, the ones that people listen to the most are the ones where I'm just riffing off of what I feel like talking about, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah, yeah. I noticed your, your Medium uh, account blew up maybe like a couple of years ago. It went from like... Yeah. Single digits. To, I don't know. You had a couple like almost viral articles. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, I, I get that too. Like I, I just wrote, I wrote a piece and um, I'm traveling with a lover right now. And she was like, why are you spending so much time on it? Cause I actually finished it in a day, but I didn't like it. So I spent four more days on it. And she's like, why are you doing it? Cause I'm like, if I don't put these extra four days into it, I'm going to hate it. And it's going to feel bad. And it's not, nothing's going to happen. It's going to be wasted time, but at least in five days I could put up something I'm proud of. Oh, dude, I love your writing. Your, when when a, a Ruan article drops or something you've written, that's like a jewel. Like I, like, I love the stuff you're putting out these days. Thanks. Thanks. And same thing, I, I'm finally writing whatever I feel like I want to talk about yeah. stuff. And that was actually, like, you had an article, I forget exactly what it was, but I remember a line because it was a line from like, you know, one taste and pre-one taste type of thinking that I used to think was not, relatable because when i would put stuff out like that when i was in one taste it only was like, applicable to omers like i forget you said uh, something like um uh it takes two people to get uh confirmation or three uh, people yeah, yeah. The words uh, yeah if you if you experience something the best you can have is certainty and but if someone else experiences it and they tell you then you have reality 
yeah. that's all reality really is. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so something that like is relatable to people when they're on acid or if they've done a bunch of things that are a little bit counter conventional, but you put it in a way it's like, oh, well, everyone can understand this. Like I can share this to my regular friends and they'll get value of it. Like, awesome. Like he cracked some translation here, which is cool. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, so yeah, I, I want to ask you about your, your, the content of your book because I'm personally interested in that because um, it, I don't know, I'm, I'm confronting maybe my own uh, challenges with intimacy or, or patterns and stuff. And um, is there anything, I, or who are the people that you find are, are being served by this powerful women, confident men idea? Well, um, a lot of it has come from the clients that I've had over the years and over the decades. But now I find myself like when I go, I also attend workshops, right? I'm attending business workshops and I'm, and they're fantastic. And a lot of them are mostly like I'm in a room full of mostly women who are either really kicking it in the world or they want to, like, that's their goal. And what I kept finding was, um, all the rules, the conventional rules, like, you know, the conventional rules about how men and women are supposed to relate, don't really take into account what happens when a woman is, is powerful in all these different ways that she could be super intelligent. Maybe she's successful in making a lot of money. Maybe she's just, you know, confident, or maybe she's, she's in charge of her libido and she's the one who initiates sex. Like all these ways that I, I keep meeting these guys who are like, I, I totally love this woman. I just don't know how to relate with her because all the stuff I've been trained about how to relate with a woman like this doesn't apply to this woman. So I'm kind of at a loss. I'm turn I love the, the shit out of her, but I don't know. Like, I, I don't know how to, I, I haven't been given the tools for how to relate with this woman. And then she's often saying, I feel like I, I don't believe this, but I feel like society is telling me all of these, all of my superpowers are somehow detriment when it comes to relationships. And so I'm trying to dismantle all that and come up with a new way of describing how men and women relate to each other. It's based, it's just based on it. It's not counter to that. It's just a different set of rules for what actually works. And so that's kind of what the basis is. Yeah, I think this is so, I mean, I don't know if I want to get into politics, but this is so uh, culturally uh, relevant with a lot of the stuff around masculinity and gender stuff. Because I mean, I keep reading, and I think this was in the book, The Virility Paradox, which is a great book on testosterone. Mm -hmm. But I, th I might be, I believe what he wrote was two of the highest indicators of divorce are when a woman makes more money than the man. And if the woman has above average testosterone. Like, I mean, to put it in like, you know, other terms, like she's too masculine or, or right. what fault of her, or the man or, or neither, like that's like almost a, a surefire, sure indicator of things are not going to go well. So yeah. what do you, um, what do you, what is your approach in such a situation where maybe the man's feeling emasculated or the woman who means well, who's done everything right is just not feeling turned on by her partner because she has something that's considered masculine over him or something like that. Right. So this is going to be like a super, super oversimplification and won't do it justice. I'm just going to, we're just going to acknowledge that right now. Like about this for, for days before all the pieces are in place. Okay. So this is a super oversimplification, but this is what I boiled it down to. Um, the basic a, or a basic question that needs to be answered is who, like, does he take the lead or does he follow her lead? And in, with a, in a relationship like this, it turns out he, he can't decide, he can't just get one good at one and not be good at the other. Like these women that I'm talking to, they either picked a super alpha male that, that can, can meet her, you know, and, like she can finally relax and surrender in his strength. But any time that she takes, tries to take the lead or tries to show her, her, her assertiveness or any of those things, he, he, he's out of his element. He may belittle her. He certainly is threatened by her. He does all kinds of things. So the other possibility is she gets a super, you know, 
supportive guy and she loves that but she wishes that he had some of the qualities of the first guy so so what we know is he needs to be good at both and he needs to get good at knowing which is the right one to do well how the hell do you do that so what it comes down to is um there are three there are usually three things that i teach a guy uh confidence meaning his self-esteem meaning there is nothing about this relationship that he's trying to source his confidence from. He's just simply a confident guy because he has self-esteem and how he feels about himself. So, and I'm not just talking about the confidence to take the lead with a woman like this, but also it takes confidence to apologize. It takes confidence to like, when you say I'm, when you, if you can look someone in the face and say, wow, I was wrong and not feel any charge about it at all. Like I was wrong. That, that takes a lot of confidence. So the confidence to lead and the confidence to follow, they both require confidence. And then the second thing is intuition. And by that, I mean, he's, as men, we're, we're constantly looking for the formula or the rule book. Just like, tell me, give me the instruction manual. And that is intrinsically impossible. Uh, but what he can do is there's a whole, like an actual part of his brain where intuition lives that he doesn't listen to. And when I work with guys and I start to get them to listen to their intuition and it's telling them to do something scary, like when to kiss a girl when you're in the middle of an argument, you know? Uh, so I get him out of his formula brain, out of his, uh, his analytical brain, his his brain that's trying to analyze and figure stuff out, like his intellectual brain, that has to turn off so that he can listen to this intuition. And what he discovers is, man, it's giving him some crazy accurate information if he listens to it. And then I give them a process by which he can improve his, intu his intuitive sense. Yeah, that was one of the biggest things. That was the biggest thing I got from one taste in orgasmic meditation, the idea of resonance. Mm -hmm. Or like you, you use the wine glass analogy a lot. Like what's the perfect yeah. frequency to get the, like, it was just like, that was such a game changer because I, I mean, I was like every other guy, which is I wanted the formula. What's the right thing to do in response to this situation. Right. And it's so much easier uh, when you actually can listen to this part of your brain. Like I, I speak with this with clients all the time where they're like, Oh, I don't know what to do. She doesn't make any sense. Like, I don't know what to do. But if you, if I ask them one or two questions, they come up with almost the perfect response every time. They just, it's right? like they, they put it, push it to the side and try to figure things out. They, uh, we've been trained our whole critical. lives. Yeah. We've been trained our whole lives not to listen to that voice. Yeah. Yeah. So you just mentioned something uh, with the, with the alpha males versus the super supportive guy and um, yeah. putting in other terms, it's like uh, security and then what like the pickup world would call like a shit test. And like this is something I think about a lot because I'll, uh, I do think men are kind of in a double bind, at least on the, on the surface, where if they don't lead when they're supposed to lead, there's clearly like a drop in arousal, a drop in interest, like it's something felt. But if they do something too overt or, or, or do it in a, the slightest bit of insecurity to lead, they can be called toxic masculine or masculinity so fragile. Like, oh, he's look, look, he's trying to be dominant all the time. So I think a lot of guys, until they recognize this intuition piece, Kind of feel like well i'm damned if i do it and if i don't and it's such a such a crippling uh experience for a lot of dudes until they can recognize intuition yeah i i have this feeling and again it's kind of an oversimplification and it might it might be kind of might piss some people off but a lot of what you're talking about also is confidence so i'll talk about myself actually i'll, I'll give myself an ex as an example so in my 20s, um, I had this secret that was uh, made it impossible for me to have ever have a good relationship ever. And that secret was I wasn't tall. I wasn't like I'm five foot zero. And, you know, therefore, there's no way I wasn't tall. I wasn't athletic. I certainly wasn't charming or outgoing or, you know, like I wasn't any of those things. I was scared of women. Um, 
and so I was, tr it was because I believed that I had all those, all those strikes against me that I searched for something I could do or some way I could be that would be attractive. And when, what actually, what actually took place was that all of my beliefs about how all those things were in the way I, when I did the work necessary to let go of those beliefs and actually start feeling good about myself and start to like take on like self-esteem and confidence, I naturally became the kind of person who did the right, did the right thing in those situations you're describing and uh, that was naturally attractive. So I, because that's my experience, what I, my, my, uh, we'll call it my, my methodology or my modality, we'll call it my modality. My modality is, is that whenever you're trying to think of what the right thing to do is, you're trying to think of like, you're doing all that math about, oh, if I act this way, she's going to respond this way. You have to, you have to move all that out of the way. All of those are a function of your confidence and your intuition. When you have confidence, you don't think in those terms. And when you have intuition, you naturally do the right thing. So those are the, those, that's what I focus on. Hmm. Not the math of how women respond to certain types of guys. I get them out of that, that style of, of even, even that style of thinking. Does that make uh, sense? So this might actually make my next question moot. That's what, what came up. Um, Cause I meet a lot of feminist women, like, militant feminists like we can imagine like almost a trope of like angry feminist women for some reason i'm drawn to them i don't know why um but something i experience sometimes is they want to play the dance of courtship seduction whatever like they're they're engaged but there's a part of their mind which is like i don't want to give you power because and and we can maybe dissect on whether that's a real thing or what the power thing is actually but like i've actually had a discussion with a recent lover who was like, I wanted to do this thing that you were like, we were moving towards and I knew it would feel good, but, but my mind hated the idea that I would be surrendered to a man. What do you do when oh, interacting with someone like that? That is super hot. I mean, there is so much juice. There is so much opportunity to, to play with her, her inner conflicting beliefs and f to, to have fun playing with, that conflict between her desire and the juice that she can feel, the attraction that she can feel and what it would feel like to surrender to you in all the ways that all of her feminist training tells her not to do. Like if you just had fun with that conflict, then, you know, the right thing would happen. If you, if you aren't, if you would, my recommendation would be don't be goal oriented around it. Don't, don't, have it be that your goal is to overcome any of that that's there's juice just in the play of what that is and it's that that is more likely to get you into the territory that both of you want to get into because really what you're talking about is i call it the um the barbed wire around the garden i actually got that term from nicole but i think it's super accurate um but my my thought for you would be, wow, how much fun you can have with just like, not fucking with her, not messing with her, but there's juice in that internal conflict that exists within her. Like it's it's opportunity for flirtation. Can you give an example, maybe, of a flirtation in such a situation? Um, I don't know that I can. Like it would it would be so situational, you know. Yeah. I'm remembering times in, in one taste where like a lot of people would crowd around and like share how to flirt by text. I remember this like, well, I don't, I don't want to enter your name, but someone we know. And actually, I remember actually, this is a random memory. Um, I was being topped by this pickup guy who we were trying to collaborate with. And he was just like, I mean, in his terms, a mocking the shit out of me. Like he was tooling me really hard. And I was consulting you by email on how to text him back. <laughs> it's like, what am I? One of my weaker, I don't know, whatever. It was an education moment for me. Yeah. Um, what my approach, just as a coach these days compared to, compared to back then, is 
my, my conversation with you in a situation like that today would be around your mindset. Cause if I can shift your mindset, then you get to the place where you know what to do. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's more my coaching style these days, especially when I'm working with couples is they'll come to me with their problems. Then I'll talk to them about what they're thinking and what they're like, what are the, what's the underlying intention behind why you did a certain thing? What's, and I don't use that languaging when I'm talking to them, but actually what I'm doing is I'm getting down to the mindset of what's driving what's going on. And I, I, if I can make one small shift in a mindset, then the behavior changes on all of a sudden things are working well. Hmm. So I can give you an example of that. Um, so um, I was working with a couple. Um, she was, they, they weren't having, they, they were functionally sexless marriage, meaning sex less than once a month. She never particularly enjoyed it, especially with him. She did it, you know, because it was her wifely duty, like she was Catholic, you know, wifely duty, but it was never enjoyable for her ever. So uh, the first thing is he needed to know how to make it enjoyable for her. So we spent a lot of time focusing on that, right? How, how can he actually pleasure her? She needed to believe that it could actually be pleasurable. So we got to that. So now it's actually feeling good. But she still has all this conditioning around what it means for her to be a sexual being. Like now she's facing a whole new set of issues because now she's becoming the sexual being she always, always was. And he can meet her and actually make it enjoyable. But now she's confronting her, her conditioning. And this is a place where it would be good for him to have some penetration skills, some skills of penetrating through the resistance that we know she has that she she'll put up resistance but she doesn't want to win that's not a battle she wants to win in this particular case right so we're leaving the territory of what people would call consent right like consent is for people who don't really know each other that well and don't have connection uh, but in this situation, they have to move outside that she's going to give him permission or that she's going to give be always tell him what to do all these things. She doesn't have, she doesn't have the skill to know what to ask for. She doesn't have the conditioning to tell him or encourage him, let alone take the initiative. So he's got to be a penetrator. Okay. And we're talking and talking and talking, and he's scared out of his mind about this idea. Like I keep telling him to trust his, his feelings and his intuition under my guidance where he may do the wrong thing and it might cause some wreckage, but I'm their guide. So I'm going to make sure that that gets cleaned up and the lessons are learned, right? Like I'm, yes, I'm putting a flamethrower in his hand and encouraging him to do something with her permission. So... I'm telling him to listen to his intuition, listen to his intuition, listen to his intuition, because he's so conditioned to listen to her permission. And that's not the right tool here. And finally, he, it's not making sense. And then finally, he says, oh, I think I know what this is. This is like when I'm coming home from work and I'm going to stop by the burger place. And I text her and say, hey, do you want a burger? And she says, no, I'm not that hungry. And I just have a hunch. And I buy a burger anyway. And I bring it home. And she devours it. And she's so glad. And I said, yeah, that's it. That, if you can, on a, that was the moment when he trusted that he, it was conceivable that his intuition could be right. So the mind shift was that him believing that his intuition could be right. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. Cause even, I mean, I mean, not to necessarily break it down logically, but I bet in that situation, there was many situations where he didn't listen and he could even look back at the past and be like, well, when she says she doesn't want a burger, she actually does want a burger. And, uh, you know, so many guys will take for face, uh, take for truth, like the words being spoken. That's not the real level of communication. 
Right. But think about how subversive it is, how uh, potentially like I'm, I'm empowering this guy to sometimes trust what he thinks over what she's telling him. How right. subversive, like that is some dangerous shit, man. That is subversive. So, so it's, it has to be done skillfully. Does that make sense? But, but yeah, you know, like there are times when someone's going to lie to you. And if you have a, if you have the cap, if you cultivate the capability to discern and to feel another human being, to sense another human being, to like not, and this is again, my modality, my, my modality tells him is going to say, don't try and analyze. Oh, she, I noticed her eyebrow did this little thing, or I noticed this little twitch. Like I encourage guys not to take it into the intellectual, like not to bring their intellect into the, into the thing until later. But just to say, I don't know why it's totally fine to say, I don't know why I have a hunch that this is what's going on. I'm just going to trust the hunch and to, to let that side of their brain have some breathing room and some speaking room so that it can learn and hone and polish and get better. Yeah. I think that's such a big uh, reality shift for a lot of people. I mean, men, but people in general, because we're, we're raised to like take everything as truth. And when someone lies, we're like, how could they lie? But everyone lies. I mean, that's like right. kind of normal. And like, the, I right. mean, it's such a big shift to be in full acceptance and approval of the fact that people lie and being okay with that and responding accordingly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, oh, go ahead. Do you have something? Yeah. So, um, you know, there are, there are times when a woman in a coaching situation, because a coaching situation is time out. Mm -hmm. It's like we're stepping out of our lives and we're going to take time out and we're going to step out of it and look from above and talk about what's going on. And it is often in those times when a woman will say, actually, no, I really did want you to, to take, to penetrate through my resistance or something. Right. So those, those moments, if a woman has a moment when she's willing to be honest about a, something like that can be so, 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 so valuable. And you don't get that when you're in play, when you're in real time, you don't get that because she's, you're both in your stuff. So on, on that note, and it tying into something you said about winning, it's like not a game she wants to win or something. I think that's the thing that comes up a lot in relationships where, yeah. I mean, and even relating to the whole power thing that I asked you about earlier, it's like, we don't want to lose this little battle. It's like, if, if I surrender, the, the other person wins. And what I try to get people to shift into is like, you're actually not in a zero sum game with your partner. Uh, you're in a co-op game. And like, there's like, there's a, a reality where you both are winning. You both have the same incentive, but it's such a hard shift. Like, I forget what you said a few minutes ago, but is there a way you guide people away from being like, anytime the, my partner wins, I lose? Uh, I mean, I think you just now said it beautifully. Like, it's, it's, it's really collaborative. And it's actually, a, like, all that stuff about winning and losing is just part of a game. And really what's happening is that you're, you're co-creating experiences together. That's really what you're doing. So um, if you're too attached to that, to that game of like, oh, if I concede, then I've handed my power over and then my partner is just going to presume that they're, that they're the powerful one and I'm going to have to, they're going to insist that I concede every, like underneath all of that, hopefully is connection between two beings who are having fun with all of their prejudices and all of their conditioning and all of their quirks and all of their, you know, weirdness. So, so what I do in that situation, I can't give you a specific algorithm or a specific set of instructions, but basically what I do to break out of that pattern is to get them back in touch with the underlying connection that they have as two human beings and operate from there. Hmm. Uh Speaking of or new patterns or maybe authentic ways of being, um, I, I want to ask you about power dynamics and your take with masculine and feminine, because I, I mean, 
one of the places, one reason why I think this is so interesting other than just sex and intimacy being interesting is that sex, and I think the only other area of life where this is true is comedy, is where like your intellect can't override what's true. It's like right. it makes you horny or not, it makes you laugh or not. Um, which is why I think there's so many life lessons from exploring this intimacy stuff. But on that, I, I'm curious in what you think about the, I don't know if you would call it traditional, but like the idea of power dynamics and, and masculine feminine, which I think is being challenged a lot with cultural conversations. Totally. You know, I hit on this a little bit earlier. Um, and what I'll say is the instant you do something that actually succeeds, you actually, you know, you, you tried something and it was amazing. The instant you do that, you are at risk of turning it into a formula. So I, I don't care how powerful a guy is and how attractive his power is to a woman. At some point, it's going to be the wrong tool for the job. And he's going to be so accustomed to playing that card that he's going to be lost when that's not the right card to play. So I think power dynamics, I think it's important to be able to, to step up and be a powerful human being that your partner experiences. I also think it's, it's, it's as important to know and not you know, be a powerful human being as it is to know how to be a powerful human being. And so then it comes back to the tools that I talked about earlier, which is if you if you've succeed as the power powerful one in in the relationship and she's she loves it um you still you can't like you still every single time have to use your confidence and your intuition to say to determine whether that's the right thing like here's an example so i'm going to use it since your since your audience is familiar with one taste i'm going to use stroking uh analogy can i do that Will they? Yeah, will so it make sense? Then? If it doesn't make sense, I'll add it to the intro. To Great. So, if I if I have been oming with someone for a long time, and I know their body, like I know their body, um, and we have we consistently have great ohms, and we've done three hundred ohms, three hundred and twenty nine ohms, and on three hundred and thirty, the stroke that I am so accustomed to using doesn't isn't isn't getting the result that I'm expecting, I change instantly. Like there is nothing, there is no pattern that I'm so stuck in that it trumps me being aware right now in the moment of what's going on. So, so that's my feeling about power as well. Like don't turn it into a formula is my, is, is what I would say around it. Uh, don't, like don't just because you succeed every time you succeed you're at risk of turning that into a formula and the most important thing is to be present to be connected to be responsive and to use to get you know get a broad range of tools and and be be really adept at using those tools the right tool at any time that resonant stroke that we were talking about yeah i think that's uh that's another big a challenging reality shift for a lot of guys where, um, I mean, it's basically being okay with the unknown. I mean, all yeah. of these fellas are trying to like, kind of, I mean, to use, did you read Finite Infinite Games? I mean, yeah. yeah, I read in it. I didn't read it from cover to cover, but yeah. One of my favorite books, uh, but there's a whole thing about like, uh, trying to be a master player is basically being really good at finite games. So you can anticipate every single move, but it's very tiring and it never works uh, universally. Yeah. And yep. what you're describing is like the infinite play idea of being so trusting in the next stroke or next movement that you can move through. But it's like, it becomes almost a spiritual thing. Like how can you trust my, the next stroke if I haven't planned it before? Yeah. Uh, I, so this is very Zen. And there was a thing that I read from, from some Zen book that, that when I read it, it blew me away. And what they said is like, we're constantly trying to prepare for this particular thing that, that is in the future. Uh, but what you can do instead of that, I'm paraphrasing, but what you can do instead is just get good at what's necessary right now. And then there's a new now and you, you, you get good at the now. And you keep getting good at the now and the now and the now. And then what happens is when that thing that you were trying to prepare for uh, becomes the truth and the now you handle it well because you're good at handling the now 
right? It just becomes a part of, it just, you, you're just good at being, at, at handling anything because you're good at handling, you just got good at handling what comes up right now. Yeah, and it's more fun and ultimately more effective. Like totally. it's, more, it's reminded me of like when I was uh, younger, even like not even that recently, but I'd be so shy that I could never think of what to say. So I go home and think of the perfect thing and like wait for that opportunity again to say this perfect line. It never, it never comes out right. <laughs> you can yeah. only respond in the moment. Yeah. Women, I, I often had women's like, you know, in our, it used to be that, you know, we would, we would have a make out or we would have sex and then we would talk about the experience or they would talk about the, they would talk about the, the experience that they had with, with, we would talk about our experience with our friends. And it would often happen that a woman would say, would be, would, you know, if she was asked, what was it like having, making out or having sex with Ken? They, she'd say, it was awkward. But she'd say it with this kind of smile on her face, like she, like it, she liked it. There was something about it that was uncomfortable, but fun and different from anything she'd experienced before. And I always had mixed feelings whenever I heard that word described to me until I really understood what was really being said, which is what she was experiencing was it was impossible for her to fall into a pattern. It was impossible for her to fall into her rote routine. There was a presence that was required that she, she had to not know what happened next. Like she had to recognize, you know, we're not going to go through the bases. We're not going to, we're going to be present and figure out right now in the moment what feels good. And it is so, um, there's something about being with someone that way that is so, you feel so alive. And I have, I have lovers who, we often feel awkward. Like it's like something, it didn't go the way we thought. The only thing that we know for sure is it's not going to go. The, if we think that we know the way it's going to go, it didn't go that way. But we also have profound, profound, phenomenal experiences that we're going to remember for the rest of our lives because we were open to not knowing what was going to happen. If we had, if we had had a plan that was like our best plan, like the best plan we can come up with and succeeded at that plan. Like it went exactly the way we wanted it to go. We would be, you know, X happy, but what's possible far surpasses that. And the only way to get territory is to not know like what's possible. What's possible is beyond what we can possibly plan. And so the reason we've, the reason this person and I have had such amazing experiences because we often don't know what's going to happen in a positive sense. Right. So. I'm curious about, um, cause like an ideal, you can go from moment to moment forever and it's always, uh, but I'm curious with your experiences coaching in, in life, uh, is something lost or it does, does, what exactly changes when a relationship gets into three years, seven years, like the seven year itch is a thing. I believe Esther Perel was the one who said that, like the, the reason for the seven year itch is that we're only supposed to be together for seven years to raise a child or pair bonded for seven years to raise a child and then you move on. Um, yeah. what's, what are your thoughts on that? There is a few different things there. First of all, um, if you're looking at long term, um, I don't think um, that boredom is necessary. It can happen, but usually, you know, the phrase, like, if you're bored, you're boring. Like people are, you could spend the rest of your life getting to know someone if that's what you want to do. So that's one piece of the puzzle is it's not really boredom, but what does happen is people change. And let's hope that I'm not the same person five years from now that I am right now. Let's hope that the person that I'm connected with that I'm having intimate experiences with is a completely different human being five years from now. That better be the case. Right? I, don't want to, I don't want us to be the same people. So we're going to be two new people who have to construct from scratch what the new relationship is. I mean, it doesn't happen that abruptly, but basically you fall, you fall someone, um, you know, they're either you're different or they're different. So you have to like, be willing to reconstruct like who is 
person. And if you're willing to do that, then it's going to continue to be interesting and new and fresh and better. Like it could be better. It can continue to get better. Awesome. That makes sense. Yeah, totally. Have you noticed, and this might be the same answer, but how, if at all, have you noticed sex changes over these long periods of time, let's say 20 years even? Um, okay, this is another one of those controversial things. Uh, I'm 55. My testosterone is decidedly starting to drop. Like I can feel changes in my body and in my libido and in my, like how I feel that I can feel a shift in the, my t testosterone levels. I'm loving it. I'm having the best sex I've ever had. I wouldn't trade this decade for any previous decade. Like I'm having better sex now than I was in my forties. My sex in my forties was better than the sex in my thirties. Um, sex in my 30s was definitely better than sex in my 20s. Um, and also, it's changing I feel when I'm in the presence of a woman. Like, I don't have that ambient, urgent thing of like, I just don't feel urgency. Um, which means all the things that I had to practice how to do, like how to flirt without goals, how to, how to flirt without being disappointed if it didn't go, all that stuff that I had to work to learn how to do now just comes natural to, naturally to me because I'm not in a rush. So I can have fun. Like I can crank up the desire so high on her side that I can actually, now her desire is, is awakening me, right? So there's, it's a different game. It's an equally fun game, if not for me, a more fun game. My sex hasn't diminished at all. It's still just as fun, but it isn't driven by, like, I'm, I don't miss it when I'm not having it. So that is one big difference is I don't miss sex when I'm not having it, but it's profoundly amazing when I do have it. So it's completely different than anything I thought, anything I was told about what it feels like to have your, your testosterone shift. Hmm. Like it's, well, it's good <laughs> Yeah. I, like, oh, I mean, it was something I was dreading in the future. And yeah. um, actually, uh, I don't, you probably haven't heard of the book because it wasn't that popular. But the Verily Paradox, you might find really interesting because it has all these studies about, I mean, it's a paradox, like testosterone. all these benefits, but there's actually some benefits to having lower testosterone at times. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, it could... It could just be my personality that, you know, it could be just be my personality, but uh, I can relate with women differently. I can relate with, relate with them in a super relaxed way. I can relate with them as a person, like a woman who's super, super, super attractive. And it's rare that a guy can be around her and not have that be like the primary thing that he's experiencing. And I just experience her as a person and she's never like, she, that's a rarity for her. A whole new world that opens up for me anyway hmm. this is a random thing um i'm curious uh because like in one taste and maybe some of the other experiences you had uh were very feminized environments and like oxytocin was even championed as like this you know the, like the ultimate hormone and actually re uh, referring to the really paradox testosterone and oxytocin are kind of opposites in their how they affect behavior and hmm. i'm bringing this up because uh I was worried. I got into one taste because I had um, uh, libido issues. So I, I got my testosterone checked. I found out I was normal. And then a year into one taste of being around all this pussy and around all these women, I thought for sure my testosterone spiked up and I actually went down by like 30%. I don't know if it was because I was around women all the time, but I'm just wondering if uh, you noticed, I mean, you're, maybe we're not checking your, t uh, your testosterone or oxytocin, but changes in your behavior being in these different environments. For sure. You know, um, I'll say this, um, before I did any of this work, I wasn't successful with women and I was starving. I was starving for connection. I was starving sex. I was starving for all these things. Then I got into, you know, this kind of work and like maybe five or six years later, I reached a point where I was like, I... I'm not hung. I'm not ambiently hungry anymore. I've, I've had. I'm so saturated with 
good, like good quality, frequent sex, good quality, frequent connect, like human connection, good quality, frequent intimacy. I had all those things. Wasn't operating from hunger anymore. And um, so I got to do what in our lineage is referred to as being a responder, which means when I had sex, I, it wasn't driven by my desire to have sex. It was driven by the person in front of me's desire to have sex. And I got highly attuned, like I can feel like, oh, this one, you know, I can, it's, it's not just, um, I started, I, I don't know if I'm even going to be, have a way to say this because it's kind of tricky, but I felt like I was in response to the women in my life. So when they, I never wanted to have sex with someone who didn't want to have sex with me. I just, that was not part of my experience. Their desire, their, and, you know, in an environment like One Taste, that, that environment attracts women who recognize about themselves that they want something like that. They want more pleasure. They want more something in their pussy. They want more sex. They want more to their, their clitoris stroke. They want, they have desire. But I got to the place where I was able to experience what it feels like to be in response to the women who I was interacting with. And that's just deepened and deepened and deepened and deepened over, over the decades. Is when, I'm around, when I'm around someone who there's a, a sexual spark, I have a raging heart on. It's not a problem. When I'm around someone where there isn't that spark, I don't, I don't get an erection. Hmm. Yeah, that was actually one of the things that sold the oming thing to me in the beginning. So I was like, what does this do? Does it do anything? But uh, one thing that I've observed in, my, in myself and almost every guy who I introduced to oming was after they started oming, they stopped having an impulse to watch porn. Um, and like to the point where it's like a couple of guys called me, he's like, what the hell happened? Like I jerked off yesterday just to make sure it works. Like I had no like interest in it all of a sudden, yeah. but it could not help getting aroused in the presence of a, an aroused woman. It's just like, it, it just... It's, it's like almost like a part of her body. It just reacts. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay, well, something for better, for worse, something definitely has changed with this only thing. Yeah, totally. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, this, this hour flew by. Um, I'm looking forward to your book. It probably won't be out soon. Is that what you said? No, but I'll, you know, the, I, have a, I have a blog and the blog doesn't have a lot of the powerful woman, confident man content because I was setting all that content aside for the book. But since the book is going to take a while, I'm just going to start putting that content onto my blog. So that would be the place where people can. Cool. So can Ken start, start to, or on medium, go to Ken Blackman.com slash R E S P. No, sorry. That's wrong. Ken Blackman.com slash P W C M powerful woman, confident man, P W C M. Cool. Awesome. We'll link that here. Uh, it's fun catching up. Uh, yeah. We'll meet up soon in person in the next. Yeah, series. great, great conversation. Thanks, yeah. thanks. I I loved it. Yeah. Thanks. All right.